Yeah, welcome. Welcome very much to Conversation. A pleasure to welcome to the program a friend of mine, and I would say a friend of the universe, or the thinking universe, we might say, and that's John Rafferty, and he's the president of the Secular Human Society of New York. Very interesting person, very interesting organization, and John, welcome again to Conversations. Thank you. It's great to be back here again. It really is. We're about to talk some war stories. We'll put that off for we'll one off night over story. beer or something okay. like that. But do share your own background, if you would, personally. And then we'll get into the, hu uh, the Secular Humanist Society okay. and humanism in general and this human understanding the human condition. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm a native New Yorker mm -hmm. and uh, grew up here and went to school here right through the, the system. Uh, all the... Uh, uh, Ele from elementary school through college uh -huh. and graduate school, mm -hmm. all here in New York. I uh, did my time in the Army, as uh, we were discussing a minute ago. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, I'm married to a painter, uh -huh. Donna Markser, who's a wonderful, uh, talented woman. I have uh, four sons from my uh, first marriage uh -huh. and now eight grandchildren, four boys, four girls. And I'm a relatively happy man. Yeah, I would think so. As with I that, with that, my dotage. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Well and, said. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, uh, I I was never much of a believer anyway. I was brought up in a in a fairly uh, lackadaisical Catholic family. Catholic, uh, we yeah. didn't pay much attention to it, uh -huh. and so yeah. I didn't I didn't care much about it until the 1990s when. Uh, I realized that there was a change going on in America right. and that uh, there was a know-nothingism creeping Came in. Yeah, from the 19th and, century. And, yeah, right. Yeah, and I remember yeah. I saw a picture on the front page of the Times. I think it was on the front page. But I saw a picture on the, in the newspaper uh, one day in the mid-90s with 42, I believe it was, right. 42 senators and congressmen mm -hmm. and women standing on the steps of the Capitol to honor the Reverend Sun Young Moon. Oh, yes, a unification church. A lunatic, church. Yes, and yeah. a tax evader, yeah, right. and a convict. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I thought, what is going on yeah. with the country I, I grew up in? Right. What is happening? Uh -huh. And, you know, I started thinking about it, and I realized that um, I learned about evolution in the ninth grade. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, yeah. And now suddenly evolution was being questioned. We uh, had to... Yeah. Uh, creationism, creationism yeah, yeah. had to be to it next yeah. next to it, uh -huh. um, and people were uh, talking. I mean, I learned that the uh, I learned in in high school that the uh, founders of the country, right. who were mostly Christian, uh -huh. set up a a, a um, secular government uh -huh. so that we wouldn't have the religious wars uh -huh. that their grandfathers they had played Europe, fought and yeah. died in, yes, absolutely. in Europe. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and here were these people getting airtime on television who were uh, in the halls of Congress uh -huh. saying, we're a Christian nation, we were founded as a Christian nation. Yeah, yeah. Nonsense. I yeah. All this nonsense. Yeah, well, yeah, it was coming, yeah, in the mid-90s you're talking about. Yeah, right. So, okay. yeah. then I noticed that... Uh, <laughs> Newt Gingrich and Pat Robertson and the then Tammy Faye Baker or, or uh, was it well no no oh. I'm talking about the ones who were oh uh, they more re yeah they, they, oh. they started they were talking about these secular humanists yeah. are ruining the country uh -huh. they're the reason we're in such great difficulty yeah and if Jerry Falwell and Newt Gingrich and Pat Robertson didn't like them I figured I better get to know them uh, so, yes, <laughs> you know, yeah. so Somebody put me on the uh, on the uh, mailing list for uh, the Secular Humanist Society's newsletter, Peak, and that had been established when? Oh, or? 1988. 1988. Yeah, okay. Secular okay. relatively recent. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Huh? And that was established in 1988. This was now the late 90s, and I never knew heard anything about yeah, it. I, yeah, yeah. Huh? So I uh, I got a couple of issues of the newsletter. That's interesting. That's interesting. And then. Um, there was a notice that uh, a bunch of them were going to go to see uh, the uh, ethnologist, biologist, E.O. Wilson oh, yeah. at the 92nd Street Y. Consilience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, lecture yeah, on consilience. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can explain it to me because yeah. he couldn't. <laughs> well, it's just a, he, he's seeing a, a large systems understanding, of, and particularly of the uh, ecology, a great ecology. Yeah. And a, yeah. yeah, a major thinker. Yeah, I know. Right. I yeah. know. 
But at any rate, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and the notice said, and some of us are going to have lunch before the Sunday afternoon lecture, mm-hmm. and all are welcome. So, and it was in a bar um, near the 92nd Street Y. And so I went up, yeah. and I, uh, I walked in, and I saw this table in the middle of the room with a bunch of graybeards around it. So I walked over, and I said, um, is this the Misfits and Malcontents <laughs> Society? <laughs> and a couple of them looked at me really strangely, yeah. but several of them really just burst out laughing. Oh, good. Well, and I'm I glad figured, you. okay, I'm home. Thank God for humor. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. So... You know, so I got interested. Yeah, and, and okay. I, uh, let, let me just ask you, university, what did you study? In, so you went through university? I'm a philosophy here major. Philosophy. As okay, a matter of yeah. fact, I'm uh, very proud of the fact that yeah. I was the first uh, philosophy major at Queens College okay. in the city system. Right, right. I uh, graduated in, uh, uh, technically, 1959. Uh-huh. Actually, I was all finished in 50. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And uh, I had uh, gone to the chairman of the department two years before and said, I want to switch my major. I want to be a fellow major. We don't have fellow fellow majors. No. And I whimpered and cried and yelled and bargained. And he finally said, okay. Philosophy. And uh, so I was a philosophy major. Uh And then uh, I won a Regents Teaching Fellowship and went to um, the new school uh, for my uh, graduate work. Uh, and uh, finished all the graduate work. Finished yeah. all the work for my MA, except the, uh, except the uh, uh, thesis, yeah. which would have been a piece of cake because uh, yeah. I'm a writer. Yeah. I'm been a professional writer. You're a really writer. good writer, if I may say. Prof- Your peak. I'm, I'm just I'm, gonna, yeah. gonna plug in that <laughs> newsletter you sent out is really, really well written. I'm glad with you a think very so. well honed humor, which I always really appreciate. I'm glad yeah. you think so. Yeah. Right. I, I, I've made my living as a writer all my life. You have, okay. Yeah, and uh, uh, in the advertising business and magazines and the publishing field. So you took uh, philosophy to get into advertising? <laughs> 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 I got into advertising because uh, I, I was teaching uh, junior high school English and social studies yeah. while going to the new school at night. And uh, that was down on 12th Street, yep, that part, yeah, yep. right, okay, yeah. Huh? And uh, uh, but I, I, I never, I never wrote my thesis, I never, I, I never finished it because <sighs> I was 26 years old, I'd been in school for exactly 20 years, uh-huh. and I was really sick of it. You were, okay, uh, I was uh-huh. really just, uh, uh-huh. I said, that I've, I've had enough, uh, regret it slightly, but not all that much, yeah, but. Uh, so you asked me what? Yeah, I was no, I was just talking major. about the background and all Interesting that. Interesting thing is, yeah. I am now teaching a yeah. philosophy course, okay. uh-huh. one I made up myself. Uh-huh. Uh, autodidactically, pray, you know that term? Well, I, it's not a good, actually. I, well, not I really totally. appreciate the term autodidact. I, I do too. There's a lot it's of a room for it now with the internet. Boy, you can just sit. You got the world before you. <laughs> you can go off on anything you want That's to do. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, I'm just finishing. Uh, a graduate level course, a three year course uh-huh. at the human with the Humanist Institute. Uh, we have our last seminar weekend in April. It's three years, three long seminar weekends a year. Uh-huh. Ton of books to read. Yeah. And as I say, by the Humanist Institute. Now the Humanist Institute and the Humanist Society are they connected? The, the, the Humanist uh, Institute is connected uh-huh. with the American Humanist Association. Okay, okay, okay? yeah. Uh-huh, and uh-huh. it's also connected. I think it's on the campus, um, but I know it's connected with the University of Minnesota. Minnesota. That's where right. my daughter, my daughter's teaching there at Minneapolis. Okay. Yeah. All right. A hell of a cl- I'm told that's a real happening place. No yeah. question Minneapolis about it. Minneapolis really is really is. happening. It place, really is. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and. Uh, I've, I've just finished this course, and when I started the course yeah. three years ago, uh-huh. I spoke to my fellow board members of the Secular Humanist Society, and I said, I think that we all ought to participate in this, uh-huh. and I, I want to be the first one, and the society uh-huh. ought to pay for it. Uh-huh. It wasn't much. Yeah. And I said, I want the society to be involved. Yeah. And as a give back, I will turn what I learn into a course for the broader community, yeah, for, our, right. for, our, for our membership and for the broader community. Right, right. So just lo- last November, I started teaching what I call 
Humanism 101. Okay. And we have a loose arrangement with the Community Church of New York. Yeah, great, great institution. Terrific yeah, place yeah. on East 35th Street. You're heading there tonight. I'm going there yeah. tonight. Uh -huh. We have a book club meeting <coughs> uh -huh. tonight. Um, when, uh, and we, it's a study group. What uh -huh. I've, Humanism 101 is a study group. Uh -huh. I've made it very clear in the newsletter and online and on Facebook, this is not a coffee clutch and this is not a book club and this is not a, uh, a round table. Uh -huh. This is a study group. Okay. If you haven't read the books, don't come. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. uh, and I got in January we had 24 people. Okay, that's and we had yeah. a terrific conversation. What about humanism as a philosophy? Can you just really maybe quickly go over when did that come into the lexicon and existence as institutionally and so forth? And where does it fit in with the other? systems of understanding about the human condition okay. as, a, as a philosophy or as an <laughs> approach to okay. understanding the human okay. condition. Okay. Uh, yeah. You don't ask easy questions, do you? Well, I, no, it just <laughs> occurred to me, you know. I didn't. Okay. Uh, the word humanism has been applied uh, to uh, Epicurus uh -huh. and his, his philosophy of the, of the good, pleasurable, integrated life. Uh -huh. uh, many people think that Epicurean and Epicurus just means pleasure. Yeah, but yeah, his idea yeah. of pleasure was uh, the integrated life. Okay. Investigated life. Yeah. We yeah. also ascribe the word humanism to the, uh, uh, to the movement of the Italian Renaissance and then later into the English Renaissance, uh, continental actually, uh -huh. of the, of the uh, uh, 14th and 15th centuries uh -huh. when yeah. basically associated with the Renaissance. Yeah. When People started paying attention to the uh, uh, to the classical world again yes. for the first time in a long uh -huh. time, and picked up the basically humanist yeah. writers. Humanism being simply not supernatural. Right. That that's yeah. the easy easy yeah. way. Not supernatural. Our values come from ourselves. Our ideas. Uh, our ideas are our own. We're, uh -huh. we're the thinking animals who have evolved a system of ethics. Yeah. Now, well, that's, in yeah, the United okay. States, yeah. uh, humanism in the United States came out of a couple of streams of thought. Uh, the transcendentalists okay. of New England in the late 19th century and also the ethical culture movement. That'd be like ethical culture Emerson and, and, and oh, yeah. Owen and yes. yeah, okay, yeah. Exactly. There right. was a lot happening there. In the a lot yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah. And also the ethical culture society. Yes. And okay. ethical culture is humanism. Yeah, okay, no yeah. question about uh -huh. it. Humanism in America is is roughly divided into two camps: religious humanism uh -huh. and secular humanism. Where Maya, uh, there are okay. there is, for instance, well, as I just said. Ethical culture is religious humanism. Yeah. It has no supreme being, yeah. but it does talk about ethics, morality, right. the good life and everything else in terms of a spiritual sense and a feeling that there is a force in the universe. Ethical okay. culture. Is Ethical culture, uh, yeah, really yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. And, and understand Unitarian universalism yeah. is also. Yeah, that's where my family comes out. Okay. Of there, yeah. And... Uh, there is, for instance, humanistic Judaism. Mm -hmm. Several, uh, a lot of people, uh, a, 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 a lot of humanistic Jews all over America. Uh, who else? That's a, even a, um, somebody, uh, some group has started up a um, Christian a knock on wood society? <laughs> <laughs> knock on wood. <laughs> a rapper, a, a, a evangelical. Evangel evangelical yeah, humanism. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, doesn't make yeah, sense to yeah, me. Yeah. Mine is, my, the, the, the area that I'm in, mm. is secular humanism. Yeah, okay. That simply, say, well, You okay. got A for... Uh, a, a for atheism. I got this, get this off the, um, off Richard Dawkins' website. Dawkins, uh, yeah, you uh, like website. Dawkins. Yeah, Dawkins is but a power, yeah. atheism... Bill Maher, maybe, on yeah. <laughs> Comet Bane, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Atheism, as, uh, as a lot of uh, atheists have said, is not a belief, it's a conclusion. Uh -huh. And I've come to that conclusion. Uh -huh. And, But that's just a starting point. Yeah. 
Okay. How do you live your life? Yeah, right. And yeah. to me, humanism makes the most sense. Humanism is a philosophy, is an ethical philosophy, a way of life that's based on science uh -huh. and reason uh -huh. and democracy and the value and individual worth, uh, the value and worth of the individual yeah. human being. Yeah, you spoke of the Renaissance, there was also the Enlightenment. And so Enlightenment, and what's happening is that we're coming to understand things in a secular or in a non-absolutist kind of right. way, which I don't think has been the luxury of humanity. We've been here 200,000 years as a species, and for a lot of that period, we, we were born with a sense of uh, self-reflective consciousness that could ask the larger issues. We had to have some explanation for it, unlike a lot of the creatures that just live embedded in the environment. But, so we're uh, coming to understand it more and more. So we had to have some sort of an understanding. And we had to repair to these creation stories in order to fulfill that need of having that self-reflective consciousness. Mm -hmm. But as we come to understand things more and more in real terms, uh, ideal, uh, you know, s secular, uh, intellectual terms, we're getting, I think that's the trend of the future, is that we yeah. can understand things much more than we were born in, in the right. ignorant condition out of which we're emerging, yeah. Well, and it's a process that's continuing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, as you say, we're born with them. We have, we have a growing body of evidence uh, from biological and, and neurological uh, testing that indicates that our sense of right and wrong, mm -hmm. our sense of morality, our sense of ethics, is part of our evolutionary history. Uh -huh. That our uh, closest, okay. that our, that not only our closest uh, uh, relatives mm -hmm. in terms of evolution, like the chimpanzees and the bonobos, mm -hmm. uh, that they, they have a mm -hmm. sense of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. But even people, th there have been studies done with lesser uh, primates, mm -hmm. even with dogs. Mm -hmm. Dogs who will refuse to play a game if it's rigged. They will, they will play along. You know, this dog gets a, gets a, a treat for doing the thing right, and this one gets the treat. And then when this dog does the thing, does the trick right, but the treat is withheld, mm -hmm. if that's done a few times, the other dog stops playing. I know, I got a dog, and yeah. I'll tell you, he runs our place, I tell you like that, <laughs> along with the cats. They I mean, have a we, different we, kind of we, take we on find, things. We find not man. only cooperative behavior, yeah. but we find actual, a sense of right and wrong okay, in yeah. a great many animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that's part of, that's where we get it from. Yeah, okay. And we've developed it. <coughs> I just finished reading a fascinating book by a friend and philosopher named Massimo Pigliucci, mm -hmm. uh, Answers for Aristotle. Uh -huh. That's the one you're going to be discussing gonna be tonight. Dis we're going to be discussing tonight. Yeah, good tonight. for you. Yeah, uh -huh. And I uh, just finished reading it yesterday. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, and Massimo uh, points out a number of these, uh, he, il he illustrates a number of these uh, experiments the, and points out how we have become an ethical animal and this is this is perhaps the best thing we as a species have ever done mm -hmm. developed mm -hmm. a concept of right and wrong developed a concept of ethics mm -hmm. now we've done it well that's gone now, back but yeah. the fundamentalists yeah. they, 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 the authoritarians would say you can't have ethics without a supreme being. Well, some overarching absolutist thing that answers the big questions that we're coming to understand better through the evolutionary process. Exactly you right. Know, we're coming to understand the universe in yes. ways that could not have been done 100,000 yes. years yes. ago or something like that. And, th and, that, and so it, it, it's really interesting like that in humanism really, uh, it, 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 secular humanism or understanding in an intellectual sense that is interesting and we want to get into that. We got a lot, we want to talk about Pi Day and other kinds <laughs> of things, but it's interesting you got this society and it's operating. But also, I, 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 we're in television here and I wonder if we could just indulge me a minute or something. We're in television and I was talking to you 
uh, about the educational potentiality of television, particularly with these graphics and so forth now. And I'd mentioned to you that there was a, a thing that they had on the History Channel. We've got 1,996 channels of television capability on a cable and system in New York. And I'm glad you told York, me about it. And it's a source of great educational potential including one would hope, I uh, would like to enlist you at MNN if we could to come in with some humanist uh, tr track of uh, thinking to help education because the educational process and the autodidactic learning of people who are curious is becoming richer and richer and richer all the time. Well, they had on the History Channel, they had a program that I was so intrigued with and I took it off the air. It was called The History of the World in Two Hours. They were gonna give the history of the world in two hours. And we have just a little clip of that. It's about a 40-second clip that goes through the history of what they're going to do. And the factual basis, like markers, in understanding the genome, you have markers. So the markers are the facts that come up based upon understanding that's evolving with increasing clarity, the, the reality of right. how things came to be and so forth, uh, all seem to hold. And so maybe we could run that little clip if I'd you don't mind. It. It's a little clip. It runs about 40 seconds off the History Channel. And maybe we could set that up and run that now then, please, and then we'll come back. We're talking with John Rafferty. Okay. We're going to tell the whole story from the Big Bang to the present day. How the planet prepared for the rise of man. How the Stone Age led to the steam engine. How the first seeds sprouted into cities and civilizations. Everything is connected, and the path leads to you. It took history 13.7 billion years to unfold. We'll show you everything you need to know in the next two hours. Okay, that's the thing. I, re I recommend it very heartily because, it looks again, fascinating. the markers that they have and the graphics that they have, how they can educate it. I think this little piece would do well to be showing to every eighth grader in the world because it gives a, a, a secondary or, you know, a, 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 an indication other than the creation stories that have right. been given a sense of meaning and purpose and ethics to so much of the world that I think the thing that's on the rise really is secular humanism, where so. these things are being put within a scientific understanding, a new enlightenment that's dawning on the I on think the so too, and we and it's not just an opinion. Yeah. Uh, in 1990, Pew Research pointed out that there were 12 percent of the American public, American adults, uh, did not have any religion. They, they recorded none, N-O-N-E, uh -huh. as their religious identification. Uh -huh. In 2000, that was up to 16%. In from 12 to 16. From, uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, uh -huh. And in 2012, uh -huh. it was up to 20%. That's a 20% growth, yeah. of American adults mm -hmm. have no religious af affiliation. Well, what that doesn't mean uh, they're all atheists, right, not right, at all, no, no, no. or humanists, but it means they're not going to church. But it's not only church. I mean, that's one thing. Secular it indicates, you know, you understand things. But you could also become a uh, religiously, almost religi religio, I mean, held to or yeah, bound right. by or, into, you know, that sort of thing. You could become, uh, by any absolutist kind of understanding, like a rock-ribbed Republican, you think that that's an overriding issue. There's an overriding understanding. It isn't just religion. It's also some, there are common who think that a communist thing of Karl Marx or something that is more than the normally accepted way in which we get the news, an overarching absolutist thing that answers things, uh, that trumps all the other kinds of hard one intellectual understandings that's been evolving, if you understand what I mean. So it's not only religion, it's any absolutist. It's, uh, it seems the universe is synergetic. It's the behavior of systems unpredicted by the sum of its parts. There's something resonatingly more through time that emerges as the evolutionary process uh, ends up beginning from 
as they say in the piece, 13.7 billion years ago, the universe began. All the creation, all the elements had to be created and all that sort of thing. And now we can understand that. And now humanity's been here 200,000 years. We're all Africans. We can begin to understand this in reality, 10,000 generations. And it may well be that this, defi this generation, it's hard to believe, but this generation may be the defining generation in evolutionary terms, not just political terms that makes up most all of the news. But this is a time of absolutely qualitative transformation as the extended technology begins to have an effect both in terms of weaponry and also in terms of our understanding, which is bringing in a new era, perhaps evolutionarily, in the evolution of universal consciousness. Uh, and so what a time to be born into, but it calls for intellectual understanding that is based upon the evolving collective capability of understanding the human condition within the larger universal mm -hmm. context, so perhaps. And it calls for a thing like uh, something other than absolutism because that Absolute. condition would be a resonancy more than the sum of the parts of a fulfilled system. Yeah. E evolutionarily can right. be understood. If you understand right. what I mean. I think I do. Uh -huh. And I, I, it fits in with my own philosophy uh, of life because we, we are contingent mm -hmm. and we are not, uh, we, there are no absolute answers. Thank you. That's it, what I'm saying. It, they're just we hard. would like to have, and it's, it's reassuring, you right. know, we're going to see people who've passed in an afterlife and things like that, that anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. I, uh, that, w and, and humanism is a philosophy in one sense of contingency. Mm -hmm. It deals with the problems that we see right in front of us today, okay. not in some afterlife, mm -hmm. not in some wacko uh, uh, story of creation that makes no sense. I mean, yeah. none of them do. But it makes it a lot of sense, or it me has a lot of meaning to a whole lot of the human no population coming it. out of history. But fewer yeah. as a percentage than in the past. Was that for the United States or New York City that's or New York, East New, Village of United, New York no, City? No, or was that for the United world? States, that was the United was, States. That's okay. the Pew, no, the no. Pew uh, Center for the something of religion in America. Uh -huh. it's a, yeah. I don't remember. Uh -huh. They're very good. Uh -huh. and. Uh, uh, there is no doubt about it. And by the way, as I said, 20% of adults, when you take it from uh, ages 18 to 29, it's yeah. 25%. It's higher, right? So that's an emerging, it seems to me that's an emerging thing. The Pope yeah. just resigned, not only for <laughs> physical reasons, but also they're in deep trouble. Because, and it's not only that, it's also, if I may, the political institutions that have evolved. What, you know, the reify. Mm -hmm. You reify outdated institutions. It's built into the architecture. It's built into the institutional structures, certain thoughts and all that kind of thing. We're reifying uh, those institutions out of history which have been at a level of capability or a latent capability of the collective knowledge and so forth is being transcended evolutionarily. That's the way things develop new. You, you have a steady state. You're in a steady state for a long period of time, perhaps millions of years. And then there's what's called punctuated equilibrium. equilibrium yeah. You know, Stephen Jay Gould, Niles Eldridge, and then the new appears. So you come to the end of that. It, it's an evolutionary uh, process that's characteristic of the whole history of everything. As they said, everything from 13.7 billion years ago, and we may be coming to... What I'm getting at is we may be coming to a liberated order that is inherent in our technological extended capability. At the same time, we've got weapon systems that is a Damoclean sword possibility that are, to use the current term, species lethal right. since about 1970. We're born into a period of absolutely incredible transformation evolutionarily. Yeah. We're coming into a new relationship to the cosmos that we have been able to be in through 200,000 years of human existence. Well, it's, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. But while we, yeah. I agree with you, but while we have not learned to work out our relationships with each other, right. as in terms of uh, the various ethnic groups on the face of the planet. That's we, right. Uh, and while I can talk about the rise of the nuns in America and the uh, gradual 
loosen it. By the way, uh, while everybody yeah, thinks... You come out of yeah. Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. You come out of a Catholic tradition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, loose. Yeah. Loose, yeah. you said. Yeah, okay. As a, matter of fact, uh, yeah. as a matter of fact, I've put in a job application to go back to it. Oh, really? You didn't read it? Did no. <laughs> oh, oh, you did. You had a good, you did have an application. Now that the Pope has resigned, right? And in fact, uh, he publishes um, a thing called Peak. I think you know. Peak is and uh, it's this a newsletter. Peak is the newsletter in. of yeah. the Secular Humanist Society yeah. of New York, and uh, uh, I suppose you'll cut in. Can you cut it. in? Yeah, give him a chance to. There we it. go. It's yeah, the. It's the newsletter of the Secular Humanist Society. In Edited York. by it's a guy out every named month. John, uh, John uh, Rafferty. John Rafferty. Does a magnificent job and, with a uh, cutting edge sense of humor. Anybody, yeah. anybody who wants a, uh, a free, no obligation, short term subscription uh, can just uh, email editor at shsny.org. And as I understand, Thank you, you put in opening. a job application for Pope, right? My job yeah, application. Uh, okay. Let's let him read it, ladies okay. and gentlemen. Okay. To the College of Cardinals, Vatican City, from John Rafferty. Mm. Subject, job application. <laughs> Since the Holy oh. Catholic and Apostolic Church in Rome will shortly be without a Bishop of Rome and Vicar of Christ in the Apostolic Succession, mm. and uh, he has already resigned, mm. I wrote this a couple of weeks ago, I offer myself to the College of Cardinals. Pope, Pope, Pope Rafferty. John, John the 24th. My qualifications. Mm. I was baptized in the faith and made my first Holy Communion at the traditional age of seven. Mm. And while yeah. I have been, let's call it irregular, <laughs> in my church attendance, since being confirmed a soldier of Christ at age 12, I do have other qualifications that seem requisite for the job. Mm. I am male, mm. Caucasian, mm old, <laughs> close enough to natural <laughs> celibacy as to make no never mind to the church and can swear I have never laid hands on an altar boy. I am rigidly set in my ways and have dogmatic, unalterable opinions about birth control, abortion, women in the priesthood, and the above mentioned celibacy. I also already consider myself generally infallible. <laughs> Although, unlike my predecessor, I am fluent only in English, I do speak passable tourist French <laughs> and some New York Spanglish, <laughs> Bodiga, Cuchifritos, Jennifer Lopez, <laughs> and I'm willing to study Latin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Living in Rome is fine with me, uh -huh. especially the Italian food <laughs> everyday part, <laughs> and I have no problem with all the travel the job obviously requires, yeah. as long as I get that Pope plane and the cool white car. <laughs> in fact, I've started to prepare a first papal world tour list of several important centers of Catholic worship that my predecessor missed in his travels. Mm -hmm. Cancun, <laughs> Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and a nature beach I know on St. Kitts. <laughs> I also have some marketing ideas about official tour t-shirts, caps, and coffee mugs. <laughs> If my atheist uh, is if my atheism is a deal breaker, <laughs> I am willing to recant. In <laughs> fact, you might consider that my abnegation on bloody knees uh -huh. in St. Peter's Square would make great worldwide TV, uh -huh. probably delivering a 60 share globally. <laughs> Finally, don't forget I am already named John. Uh -huh. Very truly yours, John the 24th Rafferty. P.S. My wife like dozens of papal wives and mistresses in history, promises to stay out of the public eye, or at least to not make her opinions of the church public, and to not make public fun of me wearing a white dress. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know. You're, you're, you got, you're throwing your hat into the rings, Scott Consort. Absolutely. Yeah, he's going to throw his hat into the you ring. You know, I, I feel the, the same way that George Carlin did. Yeah, Carlin I, was genius. Well, I as he said, Carlin. I have as much authority as the Pope. Yeah. I just don't have as many people believe <laughs> right, it. Right, right. Listen, that's really funny, and that's the thing. The newsletter is that. Now, maybe you could help, because one of the tyrannies of the world in which we live is the time. We have a time limit. We've only got an hour. We could talk for 25 with a drop of right. a hat. But I wonder if maybe you could go to the back of Peak, and you've got a thing yeah. that maybe be what they call in the business of television a segue. And uh, read uh, there, if you can, 
uh, the thing on pi about Pi Day, if you okay. could. Because that's something that we want to do. we got another uh, right. thing that we want to show. From modest beginnings at the San Francisco Exploratorium in 1989, Pi Day celebrations have spread to college campuses all across the country. Pi Day is March 14th, mm -hmm. 3.14 in the day in the month day format right. and it's the only holiday we have that celebrates math and science right so why not celebrate it with a triangular piece of pie all right in fact why not have that pie i'll take blueberry uh -huh. at the end of a late lunch say at almost 2 p.m. Uh -huh. because pie is 314 right 159 right that's so right 2 okay oh i see i got it. and then there's another thing and one more reason to celebrate March 14th is also the birthday of Albert Einstein. Yes, it would be good. Happy 134th, Albie. Yes, right. And it would be good to have something in our holiday season other than generals and people who have led political campaigns and whatnot. Somebody who represents the intellectual community, particularly in a, in a secular humanist way. And it happens to be that that's his birthday. It is. The 314 comes out. It's the uh, pi is the... Uh, circumference to the diameter of a circle that's worked out and goes on infinitely and so forth. And it's now, as I understand it, I've been looking it up, it's being uh, touted, uh, ac particularly at universities, across the world. Uh, they're trying to make a yep. movement to get some real attention to this uh, idea of Pi Day because it would celebrate Albert Einstein and uh, it would also celebrate the secular or intellectual un uh, coming to understand right. the world increasingly, right. which I think it, it, it conflates nicely with uh, secular humanism. It does. So it would be something, you know, un intellectual or enlightened understanding of the evolutionary process. Right. And what we were just talking about a minute ago, pi fits in, the concept of pi fits in so well because it drove people nuts mm. that they couldn't the, get the, an the, answer. The they absolute, cannot get an yeah, answer. It, it's it. energetic. It goes on forever. It does. It's it contingent. Yeah, they can do that. So, uh, so that's true. That, so that goes back to my saying it's synergetic. And there may be a consciousness inherent in the evolutionary process to that which we've been as a species for 200,000 years, just turning the corner now as we come into an area, an era of incredible. Uh, qualitative evolutionary uh, 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 transformation of the human condition, not only on the, the, the weaponry side is one, the other side is we have a technologically oriented capability of providing for all of the human society within an ecological context that could be truly liberating that we simply have never been able to have coming out of a historical condition of right. scarcity. So yeah. we may be transcending that. And so Pi Day might be a good thing to celebrate. And I don't want to go make any big point of it. I used to lobby for that back in Washington when I was in Washington doing senators and whatnot. Because March 14th is Albert Einstein's birthday. This program will air on March 14th, 2013. And it also happens to be my birthday, 200, March 14th. 200. Happy birthday. Yeah, it's my birthday. And I would like to see all the kiddies get out of school so we could all hopscotch down and get an ice cream cone and learn something. Add a piece of at pie. Add a piece of pie on top of it. But anyway, we do have one thing, uh, again, time. We have another clip. And this is a clip that was done about Pie Day. And also, we want, I got some things we can show after that, but we've got a clip. It runs about two or three minutes or something like that. It's a, in a rap song, and it's, uh, uh, we got that, I hope, cued. And maybe we could play that because it talks about Pi and sets this up. This day of celebration that is um, spreading rapidly around the world in intellectual circles and expanding. So maybe we could play that tape uh, or that, uh, that piece of... Uh, video footage now about Pi Day, okay? Check the wild. Pi is a letter of the Greek alphabet, but it's also a number as a matter of fact. 3.14159, it'll keep going with got time. The Energizer Bunny won't repeat it, won't stop. Pi is irrational, but it's risen to the top of math, science, geometry. It's 
been around since 2000 BC. Walk like an Egyptian. In Egypt it was written on the papyrus, and in Greece a man from Syracuse, Archimedes, in 250 BC. Estimated, guesstimated, pies decimal, although he knew that was impossible. Now mathematicians in every space calculate two more decimal places. Ptolemy, Fibonacci, even Newton all had pi on their minds. 3.141592653589. But pi, what it is, it's a ratio. That's a fraction, y'all. If you don't know, it's a constant in a circle. Equal and all, circumference to diameter. But why do we care? What's its use? What's it for? In circles, it's easy. It's been found perimeter. That's the distance around. Is pi times two times the radius? That's all. Come on, let's get serious. Area is pi times the radius squared. In the math that we call trigonometry, the sine and the tangent and the cosine you see of the same sign. Degrees, and all their multiples all rely on that number, on that ratio that we all call pi. 5 Day, John. Happy Pi Day. Yeah, happy Pi Day. Happy Pi Day to you. And the audience. This to program you. is airing on Pi Day. It's spreading around the world, particularly in, I guess, intellectual circles and that kind of thing. But I think it's a good idea that we have a national holiday dedicated to intellectual understanding rather than all the uh, military history coming out, out of military heroes coming out of history. And it's also spreading uh, here into other circles too. Uh, March 14th. Uh, there's a resolution here I could show here. Maybe we can come in on it, uh, Dijon, if you can, if we hold up a uh, graphic. This is a thing, a resol this is a, a thing from March 9, 2009 in the, in the uh, House of Representatives of the United States of America. Can you come up on this or where should I direct it, at my camera? Can you come up on this? It just shows House resolution such and such. Mm -hmm. And it says uh, it is declaring uh, favorably, and it's got the, I don't want to read it all, but it reads out the reasons for, to declare Pi Day as, an, as, a, um, as, a, as a significant day in terms of the ordering of holidays and recognition in the United States. That's by the United States Congress. And again, it's happening in, um, it's happening in, um, Many, many intellectual circles, this Pi Day thing. What do you think, John? Do you think it's a good idea for us to get behind and lobby for this Pi Day concept? I, yeah, I, I I'm think all so. for it. It's uh, got yeah. a synergistic quality and so forth. Well, yes. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I, I'm working on another holiday, not a holiday, okay. but another recognition at the same time. Yeah. A day of reason. Uh huh. And uh, okay. are you, f yeah. do you know the Center for Inquiry? New York City? No, I, I don't okay. think Center I do. For no, Inquiry, I don't. don't fill me Center in. for Inquiry is associated with the Council for Secular Humanism, and the Center for, uh, they're all over the world. Yeah. Center for Inquiry, um, and here in New York, uh, the Center for Inquiry and the Secular Humanist Society of New York are starting a campaign uh -huh. to get the New York City Council to proclaim a Day of Reason. Okay. As we uh -huh. have a day of prayer. Mm -hmm. We have a national day of prayer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which the extreme right wing has taken over. Mm -hmm. If you go to that, if you go to that uh, uh, website, mm -hmm. you find out very quickly that unless you're an evangelical Protestant, you're not allowed to speak at any of those functions and all. Any rate, that's pretty closed-minded. Sounds to oh, me. Oh, it's sounds terrible. Inquisition. Ab absolutely yeah. terrible. Well, anyway, it's that, yeah. Phyllis Schlafly yeah. and. And and the whole bunch of nonsense. Yeah, the the is part of 
Tea Party, maybe? Right. Yeah, yeah well, I political, it, it, yeah. I think but, further right uh, than the Tea Party. Yeah, right. Okay. Even at, at any rate, what we're trying, we're, we're just starting a campaign to get the um, city council mm -hmm. to proclaim a day of reason mm -hmm. uh, in early, the first Thursday in May. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping we can get them going this year, but I doubt it because this is an election year for the local politicians. Uh, we elect a mayor and a city council this yeah. year, and a lot of them are going to run away from something like this. Yeah, They'd because be afraid it's not of it. popular. Because right. the ed because uh, one ought to understand in a certain sense, if you're talking about a qualitative change, one ought to be very, very careful in a certain sense, because the institutions that have evolved have a great deal of meaning to a great number of people, whether it's correct or it's... Uh, yeah. destined for a clash with the future evolving understanding or something. But it, it has a great deal of meaning for a whole lot of people at the core of by the means by which they gain a sense of identity. No question. And if you're questioning something or asking them to question something basic to themselves, uh, their own sense of identity, it's very, very difficult for somebody to just jump into the, into the void. Couldn't of agree uh, with lack you. of understanding. And we ought to be appreciative more. of that, it seems to me. And there ought to be up on that table room for there to be a, uh, a, an involvement of everybody in some way. So we're going to have to be a little bit careful about not getting overly uh, uh, authoritarian or overly, uh, you know, uh, thing like that to just deride the people who get a sense of identity. And after all, also, I think about it often, like I think in terms of economics, we need a new liberated economics, but the system that works, works. And it does work, and it's tried and true, and it's a very real sense. So the institutions we, and institutions, and the institutional thought patterns and these kind of things do have a, an important role to play in terms of the ongoing nature of society. So y the, the too abrupt a uh, change is not something that we could expect app appropriately to be characteristic of the whole of the human condition. And we ought to be respectful of the fact that other people's ideas and thoughts we should pay attention to include them in the pattern. That would include even a political leadership that despite all the money that goes, all the horses and all the king's men of all the trillions of dollars that goes into economic planning and education and all this, thing, they still have not, collectively, humanity, come up with a, what would be called like an operating manual for spaceship Earth relevant to the emerging new reality. The intellectual community hasn't either. So we're all in a play and we gotta have something that can be inclusive of everybody which includes those responsible for the inherited institutions, if you know what I mean. Some of those are religious, some of those are political, some of those, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do, and yeah. I hope I didn't give you the wrong impression mm. when I say we want to do a, we want to have a day of reason. Yeah. We're not asking anybody to drop a day of prayer. We, yeah. We're not proselytizing. Uh -huh. okay. I don't, you know, I still live by the, 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 the rallying cry from the 60s, whatever gets you through the night. Uh -huh. If religion is your thing, if belief is your thing, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Go with your God. That's fine. But you understand not, what happens in a dialectic. What, if you get too it's coming up. from the yeah. other direction, yeah. Harold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, ones, okay. the, the religious writers, the ones who are telling us, you have, you non-believers have no place at the table. Uh -huh. We're perfectly, I, we don't have a problem with that. Well, I'm not trying to convince anybody yeah. not to believe. That's nonsense. I don't want that. But I do want you not to be able to put your nonsense in my grandchildren's school curriculum. Well, that's right. Go to Texas and talk to the Texas school board. They set the pattern for the textbooks and all that. Yeah, but I'm just sort of saying in a certain sense, it's uh, is a lot of people are going to claim that reason is on their side. Look at what we've got going in the Congress of the United States now. I mean, they've got a, a, a dysfunctionality that is almost hard. Uh, and they're both saying, we have, and, and remember the First World War? And everything, and remember the history of the world? Everybody had a belt, God mit uns. Everybody's saying God, or the reason, or whatever criteria you want to have for giving identity and so forth, is on their side against the people who are uh, not. Right. And, and look at the, the uh, 
the dissension that's going on between all the various claims by various groups to having truth on their side. Right. It's a it's a big claim, and yet truth is probably pretty eclectic in its synergistic resonancy of including everybody. I'm just saying, with the, you, you understand what I'm saying? I think I do. Yeah. And I never claim to. I, I never. And I, I think most humanists mm. don't claim truth. We don't claim truth. Mm -hmm. We claim contingent truth that there is this is what we know now mm -hmm. for instance yeah. evolution yeah we know more than we did 50 years ago or we know more than we did 10 years ago or 200 years yeah. ago think, so that, think we, in we, those we terms we yeah. change mm -hmm. but yeah. we not we don't say this is what we know about evolution right now and that's what it is for all time uh -huh. we learn more mm -hmm. and we change yeah. our opinions mm -hmm. we learn and Take, go back to your uh, point about economics. As we learn more, we are living in a society today, we were talking about robotics before, we were talking about... Amazing. It, which yeah. we couldn't have conceived <laughs> no. 40 20 or 50 years, years ago. ago. Even. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so the world has changed. Mm. Yeah, right. And so we have to think about it mm -hmm. in a different way. Mm -hmm. And from... The point of view of philosophy mm -hmm. and of ethics, mm -hmm. that's where we, that's where my people, the humanists stand. Yeah. Uh -huh. As things change, uh -huh. we change, and we change the world, uh -huh. and we change our ideas, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and we have no problem with that. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's called, the, of, they had the Enlightenment after yeah, all. One of, you one of, one of, our, one uh -huh. of our members got a letter from his cousin, uh, who was a congressman, by the way, and he said, you have no idea of the immensity of God's infinity. Uh -huh. yeah, and when I read that, uh -huh. I said, you know, this guy comes at it from that point of view. Uh -huh. But where did infinity come from? Uh -huh. It's our idea. Uh -huh. We're the ones who conceived it. Uh -huh. We thought it up. Mm -hmm. And we can think up anything. But we've only been here. We're just a blip uh, in evolutionary terms. We've right. only been here 200,000 years. And the universe has been existing apparently 13.7 13 13 billion, billion years. billion years. But by the way. And it had to go all that time. It all, right. it all had to be created. And then we, how in the heck did it but all get going? isn't it possible mm -hmm. that there is no such thing as infinity? Well, okay. That's another but thing. But we thought it up. Yeah. What I'm saying yeah, is what are you we're saying capable mm -hmm of changing it. And you said a little while ago that maybe we're at the point where we are making the universe itself Gordon sentient. Child, George Gordon Child wrote a man That's makes himself. Saying. And also they've written, and what we have, it seems to me, just understanding things in a, uh, we have a unique capability in the evolutionary process. I mean, there's all the, 99.999% of all the species that have ever existed in evolution have gone extinct. That's something to think about. And uh, we've come up along the line. In 1962, we were very close. And we have a unique capability, it seems to me. I mean, everything is related, as Mr. Consilians, Mr. Wilson would tell you. Everything is a contemporary, and there's an ecological quality to everything. Everything's from elected Gaia principle, John Lovelock and that. But we have a unique capability of not only having a self-reflective consciousness, that can ask the larger issues uh, which come up with the creation stories and so forth over the whole all of time and all that but we also have a unique capability of extending our consciousness into the environment through tools and technology making the world other than in an eden-like sense is the way in which most creatures are embedded in the natural order okay so we can make the world different big difference between wandering around finding a cave you can shelter in and building a house with a furnace and an air conditioner and so forth. So we have this ability to do that and we've reached a point where existentially that extended consciousness can apparently from the modeling, this is something that should be on the minds of everybody since about 1970, has become species lethal. They have the ability with the weapons that exist, not inflection points of thought or something like two nine 
1905 or something. But they have weapon systems that if they were to be unleashed in a spasm of hatred, which has been very regular in our history, would wipe out the entire Homo sapien species. Yes. They could stop conscious evolution in the universe yeah. if we are apexing that. And on the other hand, we have a capability of, it, and instead of having all the unjust systems where you've had a few people owned at all the power in the more recent you know, few thousand years since the Neolithic, uh, and then everybody else like serfs wallowing around in the mud, we could have a liberation of the whole order of the humanity. Everybody could be liberated to where materially. And they could be, uh, and then that could be included within an ecological context. And then that could be something that would be including the people who are responsible for the outdated institutions as well as the vast majority of people who've never been able to realize their full potential. We may be at a moment of jump up time, jubilee, end of time, liberation at the end of a process that's just beginning to dawn as being characteristic of the very time in which we talk now. Yeah. Do you understand? I think I do. Do you feel that at all? That we're yes, in I that do. kind of a yes, time and it's hard to think that why should we, our generation, be the one born into such a moment of qualitative evolutionary transformation in the order of the evolution of universal consciousness. I think the why there is um, not relevant. That, okay. That, 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 that indicates there's some sort of agency. It's what, it's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. It is what is. Uh -huh. And that does not, what is in Kantian terms is not what ought to Emmanuel. be. So it's, it's the why. I go along with you all the way until you ask the question, why? Oh, you would bring up that. <laughs> and one of the tyrannies we have again is time. Johnny, okay, thank you good. for coming in. John oh, Rafferty, ladies and gentlemen, president My of pleasure. the Humanist Society of New York. And uh, also, once more time, let's just say happy Pi Day. Happy I'm Pi Day. I'm ready to just be a, 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 a cru crusader for Pi Day as a way that can help us this year into this period where we can realize the larger things. And one thing is, it seems, whether we like it or not, being older, you and I, uh -huh. these kids coming along with these computers and everything, and the evolution, it's, it's just going exponentially now, the capability. And it seems to have a mind of its own, or something, or a process, that it doesn't make us do any good to say, stop the world, I want no, to get no, off. No, no. It's we been can't. the want we, of old folks no, we over the ages. We, we can't do that. We can't do that. It's time for us to get out of the way. It's time <laughs> for us to maybe move and start thinking about, it's time to leave the womb of the ta of which we're coming. We're coming full term. It was a seven month thing when we did the Declaration of Independence. We're coming full term, uh, full term and it's time to leave the womb. So. Happy Pi Day, one happy and all. Happy Pi Day, indeed. March and 14th, happy you Halloween. heard it here first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I guess we could just chat here for a little bit more. So you're going to go down and read this, uh, this, uh, the, uh, teach this course today. Right. Um, answers and for be, Aristotle, that's yes. That's the 7th, so that yep. will have passed. Sorry, that yep. was an advance notice that doesn't work. So anyway, happy Pi Day, one and all. Yep. And uh, thanks again, John, for coming. My pleasure, pleasure to be here. And thanks for Dijon and Melanie for helping put this together.